Yeah. So the other thing I want to talk a little bit about is um, some of the, the stuff that's happening in, in the electronics world that I thought you might, mm -hmm. you guys might find interesting. Let's so obviously do. you all know about Moore's law, right? It's yep. a very, very, very uh, famous thing. Chicken it's the been there Yep. For uh, for all that stuff, but. Moore's law, in terms of it, in, in its traditional sense, mm -hmm. actually is not really going on anymore. Right? No, no, it's yeah. almost ended. Has it ended? Do you think, yeah, or I mean, is it almost? It's I mean, it's going to go one, a little one, bit longer. Almost a generation yeah. away from it. Yeah, I mean, Intel already skipped one generation of right. the scaling, right? So yeah. Moore's law, in its most traditional sense, it refers to the fact that yeah. I can simply double the computational yeah. capacity of something because I can cram more stuff in it at the same space that it was before. But we're hitting those limits. Yeah, so once you hit those limits, then obviously you can't just cram more transistors and expect things to mm. become better, right? So then you have to change. So now, but there is still a Moore's law going on, but at a, a layer above. Mm -hmm. So now the computational capability of systems will continue to grow, but not at, right. but not simply riding the, the transistor scaling laws. So it actually. How, so how does that happen? So it happens by it now becomes about a hybrid of a system, right? So it's right. now software, a combination of software, a combination yep. of hardware together, and design techniques rather mm -hmm. than having access to the next technology is going to create that. Uh, and is it packaging techniques as well? Flip yes. like uh, the, the double flip yeah, chip, like a, the memory on the back of the right. processor, yeah, yeah, and all exactly. that. Exactly. So now, now yeah, you've yeah. got three D integration yep. and so on, and, yep. and and more and more some right. of that. And you can even think about some of the. Uh, parallelization of software as forward integration because then you're right. parallelizing in time right? anyway yep. things like that so but yeah that's kind of where it is headed uh, I mean I don't design microprocessors my work is on millimeter wave ASICs for you know wireless and optical systems but so even for in my field this Moore's law now refers to the entire capacity of the system. Not just, oh, okay. Not just so the they, so it's okay. understood that it applies to a yeah I mean thing you yet. have to if you want right. to okay. continue because okay. all you care about is computational yep. capability. If yep. computational capability continues to go up, then you can say that, okay, we're we riding right. that. Yeah, nonetheless, yeah. So it's interesting to see that this is still going to continue. So if anyone ever tells you, okay, Moore's Law is dead, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, it, it is in one in one sense, yes. Uh, and there's other thing is that the cost per transistor actually hasn't been going down anymore. No, right? that's right. So if you want to do a, a new fabrication run on a seven nanometer state of the art. So memory is not going to get any cheaper. No, the cost of the, the except when they amortize the fab yeah. cost and the yeah. So uh, it, it depends on rate. scale numbers, right? right. Not numbers. If you, if you want to make something only ten thousand of something, mm -hmm. and you want to put it in the state of the art submit, it's going to be it's it's an yeah. niche. Just the first time you submit for that fabrication, you're looking at a couple million, right? So if you're not selling yeah. and selling them by millions, it's yeah. just not the mask cost of production is just so high that it doesn't make any Got sense. It. Yeah. Dumb me a question out of left field. Um, the RF millimeter wave stuff yeah. that you're working on. Yeah. Is there an bad analogy, but is there like an FPGA equivalent in mm. that sort of field, so to speak? So, so there, you've does heard everything have to be totally custom from scratch, or can you sort yeah. of depends on what you're learn. doing. Depends yeah? on what you're doing. Okay. So, so if you want to think of the, in, in the analogy of the FPGA, like you were saying. So you know, this whole software-defined radio business, yep. right? It's, I mean, it's huge. Right, it's the whole, big. yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you probably know about software-defined radio from the little dongles you can buy or things like that. But in reality, what software-defined radio in a, in a real mm -hmm. communication system is, is that I can have one box that can work across a wide range of frequencies, can yep. interface with a wide range of modulation formats and communication formats, and interpret them. Yep. So in theory, you could build a system that behaves mm -hmm. like an FPGA as a hybrid. Right. But on a single chip, has anyone built a software-defined radio in no that sense? No. No, maybe some in backhaul radio, they built really broadband uh, radios that can be, but they're not really quite the way you want. You can't just program it and you know do it. I mean, right. It's more custom-made. Yeah. At lower frequencies in the ISM bands, yep. yes. Like quad band and penta band or whatever, all those things you can do. But once you go into the higher and higher, like at 5G, the, mm -hmm. the, the next generation of communication, where we're actually going to jump to 28 gigahertz and 39 gigahertz carry. And that, that'll be consumer level? Yeah, yeah Stuff? I mean, it's going to be. That's right. Everybody and their uncle is working on 5G radio now. <laughs> right, so okay. It's going to happen at some point. Is that because that's a more ideal frequency? atmospheric wise or is it a regulatory band yeah. that's available how yeah, it's, why, it's why, a regular, why so it's a band they've allocated to right it. Uh, yeah, okay, so it's i think it's, right. it's an 800 megahertz around 28 yep. uh, 29 gigahertz. is that available in every country 
I think some of them are actually quite international. I'm not sure right. about uh, in Australia, but even higher frequencies in Japan, for example, above 100 gigahertz is available right. if you want to use. But Got I think it. it's become a lot more difficult. Yeah. Okay. So is that, uh, I, I heard is that of, atmospheric or is that chip level difficult? Both. Probably. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, okay. it's difficult for a couple of reasons. For example, 28 gigahertz just doesn't go through your house, especially right. if it's yep. raining. Uh, the attenuation, if it's raining, is huge. Um, mm-hmm. And they also want to do a phased array, so they want to do beam forming in the air yep. so that they target individuals uh, with a beam. And that is a totally different style of communication than broadcast mode that we're used to in cellular <coughs> networks. Exactly. So it's going to be completely different. And, yeah, uh, yeah so it's, I, I'd like to see how it's going to play out. But everybody's working on it, and obviously Nokia is working on it, which is where I work in Bell Labs. But, uh, yeah, everyone knows about this, so it's not a secret. But... Um, it's going to be quite difficult and interesting to see. It's going to have to be very inexpensive in order to be com- you know, competitive with the 4G networks and so on. Right. Yeah. Do we have to change our processes, our semiconductor processes, to manufacture no. this sort of stuff? It's all. No, is it's it, is it like silicon on sapphire? What is it? What, what's the process? No, it's just any any basic silicon. Any, any basic silicon yeah, I mean, you can I, do. Yeah. If you look at if you look at the companies who are working yeah. on these kind of things, everybody builds them in the technology that they're the expert at, right? So, right. so if you go to a company that does, um, let's just say as a hypothetical, this is a, this is not an actual example, just take yeah. a hypothetical. Let's say, take Qualcomm, right? So Qualcomm does CMOS, does builds mm-hmm. lots and lots of CMOS chipsets. And so if they were to build, they would they're gonna, build it in CMOS. They're going to yeah. choose CMOS. Yeah, because that's what their, all their libraries are in. That's what but I thought there were physical in. limitations, of, especially in the RF domain, uh, of, any, of the substrate material. Uh, any, any advanced CMOS process that is used for making microprocessors yeah, yeah. these days is, is good enough to it's make. It's good enough to oh, make? Yeah, really? You can in, even interesting. Build, you, can go, you can even build I thought you had to go e- e- really exotic materials. No, to, no, you don't need no. to. No, not anymore. So Maybe. what's the advantage of the exotic materials like silicon on sapphire? So things like, um, not just silicon on sapphire specifically, that's really yeah. exotic. Right, I mean, that's yeah, a, yeah. Almost no, I, I don't think <laughs> I I've <laughs> ever seen anyone use it. We've got uh, one fab in here in yeah, Sydney that yeah, does it. Yeah, and they also make really small waves. Yeah, right. And it actually looks really beautiful. You can see right through the wafer. <coughs> uh, but uh, <coughs> so in 3.5 gallium arsenide you know, indium phosphate process the advantage of those processes is, is the mm. fact that they have that they kind of combine very high speed with very high breakdown voltages so you can make really high power PAs uh, I got it really, okay. really really yeah. low noise LNAs and things like that low noise so they'd amplifiers. be used on the front end amplifier yeah, yeah. front end RF amplifier right right but the problem with them yeah, is yeah. that they are A very expensive right. uh, and B is that they, they don't offer a uh, level of Integration, so you can't, for example, build a microprocessor or a huge radio. with a little bit of yeah silicon. So no, you're, no, you're no, going to have to break it up. Yeah, so yeah. as soon as you yeah. want to say, I, I you're going to go on a board. Yeah, you're going to either or on a package or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. And right. then then you lose the. And also right. for three five technologies, they have to be hermetically sealed. So you so moisture is a problem. Yeah, moisture and oxygen, all this right. stuff. So you, you whereas silicon is not silicon can be exposed. Ah, uh, it's glass, right? yeah, so, yeah. That's, so that's a huge. It may not seem like much, but it's but huge. It's a huge advantage. Even even though some of some plastic packages are actually not. Hermetic. They're not hermetically sealed. Yeah, you need, yeah, they they can need get a, in. yeah, some kind of a metallic dome over it. Uh, yep. Yeah. So that increases the cost right. by an enormous amount. So. Yeah, a level of integration. I mean, that's what silicon does, right? Silicon is, on, an, on a transistor level, on an individual mm. transistor level, is not the highest performance thing in the world. Yep. Right? You can easily beat it with some other technology. But it's the integration that gives it the power. Right. I'm going to put so much functionality onto it that there's just you're not going to be able to yep. beat it. For, for example, especially for beamforming, <coughs> yes, I cannot make a power amplifier that puts out a watt. Mm. But I can build a thousand power, a little amp power amplifiers, and combine their power, Got and end. you will never beat that with anything in terms of integration and cost eventually. Yeah. So this is no, but military uses a lot of three five, uses yep. a lot of gallium arsenide because the military doesn't care so much about the cost, and also they want you know exceptional performance mm-hmm. and things that silicon just simply simply doesn't give you. Right. They want point five dB noise figure at a certain frequency. You just cannot cannot get that. So. And that also temperature ranges and things like that. But yeah, mm-hmm. so uh, they 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 is the reason actually three five and and gas and so on advanced so much was because the U.S. military put so much money into it right. uh, for their communication. <laughs> yeah, that's the other the other thing that's really the, the military doesn't care about FCC regulations, right? Right. They can they can radiate. They can do whatever they want. Whatever power you want yep. and whatever yep. frequency you want, yep. and no one cares. So yep. they can jam you. They can uh, yep. do what. Yeah, they don't care about that stuff. So. <laughs> That's why it makes it a little bit easier to design. But if you want Got to build 
uh, if you want to build something, let's say you want to build a 5G system, mm. it's not enough to make it work at 20 gigahertz. Yep. You also have to make sure it doesn't emit outside of your band, it doesn't emit anything in the other frequency. This is also true for lower frequencies too, which is very difficult yep. to, to do, especially when the channels, uh, like Wi-Fi channels are so close to each other. Of course, yeah, at, it's, it's at, a big deal. Yeah, at, at higher frequencies they're further apart. Yep. It relaxed them a little bit. Because otherwise no one would be able to build anything. Yep. Yeah, so that's, that's the kind of stuff that uh, is really interesting and exciting. And then the packaging, like you said, and 3D yep. integration, and at the system level, the optimization that takes you another step forward. Got yeah. It. So I, I think I mentioned this to you before. Uh, at Bell Labs, there, a long time ago, there used to be this Bell Labs uh, Shannon uh, lecture series. Oh. That was a long time ago, and they actually restarted now. Nice. Uh, so now we've had three, and uh, <coughs> the first one was uh, about the kind of a artificial sensing with mm -hmm. merging materials with the human body, and it was very, very interesting. The second one, which I thought why well, I personally enjoyed uh, very much, was the, the head of the artificial intelligence at Facebook was there. And he was talking about AI and neural networks and how they handle information, because Facebook receives so much data each yeah. day. So, I mean, and it, almost an inconceivable amount of data. Not, not just text, but photos. Oh, photos and videos. And, and yeah. what they need to do is that every video needs to, every, every photo needs to be processed before mm. it shows up. So when you put it, it's actually, even though it's real time, it's actually not, right? It, it gets processed yep. at some supercomputer somewhere, <laughs> and then it comes back and gets posted it, it, so that it doesn't have some content that you don't right. like so, to have, you know, yeah, pornography yeah. and so on, it has to be removed. So, but this is not done in a traditional way. It's mm. done with uh, neural networks and learning it, systems. Yeah, it's a learning system. It yep. figures out how. Okay, based on other things, it continuously grows. Right, it grows to be smarter and smarter. Uh, but it's obviously not nowhere near the the, the human brain. In fact, in fact, yep. uh, somebody asked this question, and the the thing that makes the human brain extraordinary is is how much it does, but how much power it consumes. Right. Yes. Is, is the yes. is the computation of fifty watts, hundred yeah, watts, yeah, or something. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. And how much it does with that? Yeah, yeah. It's just such a massive system, such a yeah. parallel system. And anyway, so he's talking about uh, how so neural networks is not like a, so it, take a GPU for example, like an NVIDIA GPU, which by the way is used at the heart of a lot of neural networks because of its computational capability. A GPU that, let's say you're watching a movie or playing a game, it doesn't need to be 100% error free. In fact, it's not. Your GPU makes mistakes all the time. It's just that it doesn't matter. You don't care if a pixel isn't rendered no, right. It doesn't out matter. Like you won't even yeah. notice it, right? Yep. So in fact, some of the higher grade NVIDIA mm -hmm. processors that you can buy for, let's say, 10 times the cost of a regular one, the only difference is that it's been tested so that it doesn't produce errors. Right. Right? So it's been like kind of hand-picked in a way. Sometimes, not, not always, but some, some of them are like that. Interesting. And, uh, so, uh, <coughs> what but, would cause those discrepancies? By I mean, the way, it's just so, a yeah. tangent technical question. Yeah, it's just mistakes in the in the mistakes in the uh, timing, or some bit getting flipped somewhere, or some error that exists in some. Is, is that yeah. because of the? But it's not because of the inherent design architecture. Otherwise, each no. chip would op operate identically. You're, are you talking yeah. about quantum? No, 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 uh, I'm not. No, no, not, not, not at that level. Well, no, but it, it, so, how would it? So it, the, the thing is about it. If you look at the architecture of the hmm. GPU itself, it, it's a massive computational platform, yep. and sometimes it, it's pushed a little bit beyond how fast it can go. Let's just as an example, right? Okay. So if you push it a little bit faster, it's so it's not an overclocking. Yeah, it sometimes exam. makes mistakes okay, here and right. there, and some bits may get flipped here and right. there. And these errors happen all the time in any computational network, yep. right? It's just that sometimes that sometimes it's unacceptable, and sometimes there is error correction behind it, right? Mm -hmm. So a wireless system can ha can have bit error rates in the order of one to the minus three. Right, yeah. so out of every 1,000 yeah, bits yeah. is one it's wrong, one. right? Which is very, very bad, right? Yeah. But there's so much error correction behind the system such that the overall system is error free or it goes below one to the minus 12. So for GPUs, uh, for example, they may not do error correction because they don't care about some bits being flipped here and there. Yeah. And the point I was making originally was that in neural networks, because it's a heuristic system, actually errors that aren't catastrophic necessarily, mm -hmm. right? Because in network, the system is constantly learning and constantly correcting as it goes forward. And uh, so it, does, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, your brain makes mistakes yeah, yeah, all yeah. the time, yeah. right? But it doesn't necessarily matter. Because your, your eye is not perfect. You no. think you're seeing a perfect yeah, image, but you're, you're not. not. Yeah. Your brain's in yeah. filling in That's the blanks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. fact, there's just so yeah. many things that go wrong, but it's because it's so massively mm. parallel and so much stuff happening all the time, it get, kind of averages out. Yeah. And it turns out, uh, as this, uh, uh, as the head of the AI uh, uh, person at Facebook was talking about, 
AI lab is that yeah this this so you can take advantage of that you can take advantage of the the algorithms that go into neural networks the fact that they don't have to be perfect to constantly reduce the power consumption of the system because you don't need to be so computationally right. aggressively trying to fix everything it may not matter right so he was saying also that uh, in your GPU, for example, you do 16 point, 32 point floating point accuracy. Yep. He's, he was saying that you can you get away with four or five. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't matter, right? <laughs> because it, I mean, it, it doesn't make that much of a difference, right? So it, it floors out yep. it, it, it very quickly. So he was saying a next generation of uh, DSPs, so called, for mm -hmm. neural networks, don't need to be 16 point floats. So you can get rid of all of that bring the power down, make the system more efficient. So and this is only something we've learned in recent times. Yeah, is because it? there's a, yeah, this is right. very, very, very right. recent stuff uh, because experiments at that level are just simply not that common. Uh, you're right. So they're just basically figuring this stuff out. So I realize they went down, not quite went down the right track. Oh, we're pushing towards more precision, more precision, and then they find out, oh, we don't actually need yeah, it. Yeah, you need a lot only of practical some, purpose. Yeah. Some scientific yeah. applications, of yeah, course, oh, for you sure. need rigorous. Yeah. Yeah, and I but, know for an operating yeah, system yeah. is a little bit different, for example, right. when you have a depth of a memory, you're putting a lot of data in yeah, and out. Yeah, yeah. But for neural, neural networks, for example, we can get away with it. So it is really cool. To, mm. Yeah, it, I was uh, really, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering some aspects of it <laughs> because it's, AI is not my expertise, but uh, you can actually go and watch mm. that episode. Great. Right? It's uh, on Bell Labs' uh, Shannon Luminary series. Cheers. If you go Try on YouTube, they're on, yep. they're on YouTube, it's easy to find. So go and watch and listen to this, uh, this gentleman talk about it. He's uh, obviously an expert.